Hey, it's Tim here. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the index function. Now, the index function is one of these functions that I promise you, once you know about it, you just end up using it absolutely everywhere. So in today's video, I'm going to be showing you what the index function is and lots of creative ways you can use it, including a couple of uses I use nearly all the time uh, in combination with other functions. OK, let's get stuck in. OK, so to get started with this video, I'm going to start with the American data set. This is actually going to be the data set we're all going to use. I'm going to go ahead here and select the second superstore cells here. That's the American data source. So go ahead, click that once and we should be here. Now, with all the functions, what I keep reminding people is that they are actually all documented inside of the product. I'm going to say that every video because uh, people always forget. So I'm going to type in INDE here and you'll see that the index function comes up. Now, this is essentially a very simple function. What it does is it essentially counts rows in your data set. That's it. There's nothing more to it. That's pretty much it. The only condition, though, is that you can change the way it counts based on this concept called partitions. Now, don't worry too much about partitions. I'm going to cover this in a separate video. Once that's done, you'll see in the link above. But essentially, partitions allow us to group our data in different ways. So let me show you how the index function works. Then I'll cover the partitions element a little later. So let's go ahead and double click this index function. I'm going to hit the command plus here just to make this a little bit bigger. Control plus if you're in a Windows. And now you can see this is the function. Now, this is it. It doesn't have any expression. Nothing goes into it. And so it's actually quite uncommon to type a calculation called index because the fastest way to bring it into view is to actually type it in context. So I'll go ahead and call this index here. I'll just go ahead and call this index here and I hit apply and you'll see that I get my index function here on the bottom left hand side where it's highlighted green. But I'll hit OK and I'll actually show you how I use index nearly all the time. I'm not going to bring this item in, but I will show you that it does exactly the same thing. Let's go ahead and bring in cells onto text. This will give us the number of cells in our entire data set. Then next, I'm going to go ahead and open up the product hierarchy by hitting this arrow. And I'm going to bring in category. Actually, I'm going to bring in subcategory instead because we need a much longer list of items. And this is all I'm going to use for this demo. Now. If you just double click inside of the rows or column shelf or inside of the marks pane, it automatically opens this sort of small calculation window. You can just see it there and you can just start typing. So because this function is so simple, it's often faster just to do this. And once it's done that, you can just uh, complete the uh, function like so and then hit enter and you'll see that it immediately works. Now, by default, the index function is actually a measure because it's actually trying to count the number of rows in your data set. So it will always come back and render as a measure. Now, if you don't know the difference between blue and green fields, I highly encourage you to go to Google and have a little search and really understand that topic because it explains why the chart's behaving the way it's behaving. If I just go down here and I just look at this, you'll see that accessories has this really sort of bizarre index value. And that is essentially an index value of one. You can see here it says index along table down one. Let me go to the next one. Index along table down two. Next one, three, four, five. So it is counting rows, but the way it's representing it doesn't sort of make sense because if it was just counting rows, you just want a number next to the row. And so the reason this is happening is because this is green. And so Tableau interprets this as a measure. And therefore, once it's set to automatic, we'll actually want to draw the bar chart. So let's go ahead and change this to a discrete item here. So you can see that I'm changing it. And now it switches to a text representation, which in this setup makes it a header, which makes it a count. So now you can see the index function working as it's expected. It's a really, really simple function. And it's a really nice way of adding row numbers to your data set, to your tables. Yes, we don't build tables in Tableau. It's the most unprofitable sector, but this is a really useful feature because you can use it beyond just tables. Before we move on though, let me just show you that this field that we created earlier here actually works. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this one that we created as an ad hoc calculation in the row shelf. I'm just gonna remove it from the view. Then I'm gonna drag my index from the calculation windows on the left. 
Now you'll see that it creates exactly the same bar chart. But now that I'm here, I'm gonna take an opportunity to highlight a couple of things. Now, the reason this is drawing a bar chart is because it's using the automatic chart type. Let's say that you actually quite like this bar chart. Let's say that you actually didn't mind it. Then what you can do is you can change this chart type and choose something else. Let's say, for example, a circle. You can sort of play around with that. And creatively, you might have a use for this. Um, you might have a use for the fact that the further down the data set you go, the higher the rank changes. And so you can actually help do things like separate out your data set if that was the case or that was the instance that you wanted. Let me just move this down to subcategory. And what you'll see is that everything sort of goes back down to a dot. But if I actually go back in here and change this to subcategory, then you'll see that I'm now doing exactly the same thing. You've got the count here on the left hand side. But now creatively, I've sort of created this nice separation of data and I can actually go into the axis, edit the axis, invert the axis, if I can do that over here. And now I've sorted my data in order, uh, in, in the order that we had it before, but I've actually managed to separate out the marks for whatever creative purpose you might need. So I just wanted to highlight that because sometimes, you know, what Tableau does isn't necessarily useful. You just have, isn't, isn't necessarily useless. You just have to adapt it to what you want it to do. Okay, but we've got to straight away from the topic here. Let's go back and let's go back to where we were before with the bar chart. And what we need to do now is just set this to discrete and we're back to the beginning. The other thing to highlight is that it was talking about this terminology called table down. Let me go back again and hover on these tooltips. We'll see that it says index along table down one index along table down two. And that's because earlier on, I mentioned this concept of a partition and essentially that's what it's doing. It's telling you how it's looking at the data set and what partition it's using. It's using the table down partition. So if I go back forward, table down essentially means that it's looking at this data set as an entire table and it's working its way down the list. And that's the direction that it's counting in. Okay. You can actually see more descriptions of that over here. But one of the things you have to understand is that this is a very complicated topic to explain clearly. So it won't fit into this video. But I will say is that you can manipulate this to work the way you want. I'm just going to show you one simple example. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and bring in category in front of subcategory. And you can see now that I have the count going from the top to the bottom still. But maybe I want to count within each subcategory. And so essentially when it gets to five here, I want it to actually start again at one to start counting within office supplies. So what I'll do is I'll go down here, I'll go to compute using, but this time I'll actually choose the subcategory as the computational thing that it's going to use, essentially the partition. And when we do that, you'll see that it starts again. And so now I can move the index in front of the subcategory and it now acts as like a way of counting rows. This is a really simple example because you'd probably think, well, what if you just go and change this to category? Isn't it going to then start count within within each category? The answer is no. <laughs> and so to explain that, I, I genuinely need a separate video to do that. So I'll do that in another video. Uh, you can actually get this to work. I'll very quickly show you why. Don't pay attention to why this works. If I just go down in here, I'm just going to create another function called all. I'm going to put this in brackets. Um, and I'm just going to do this very quickly so you, you, you can see that it's possible. But in order to explain why it's working, I really need more time. So now that I've created this all function, what that does is it creates a, another partition for this category element over here. And, you know, if I just removed subcategory and then set the index to count to category, then it would work. But as soon as I add subcategory into the view, you'll notice that the count breaks down. So how do you fix this? Well, that's when you bring in the boss level tools in the table calculation window. And I'm just gonna set this to category and subcategory, okay? And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm sort of creating like a, a, a grouped partition. And then I'm gonna tell it to count at the level of category. And now you'll see that it's working. So what I did is I selected two items, category and subcategory. Then I told it, hey, can you work this table calculation at the level of the category? And now you see this works. And so now I can exit this. And if I drag it in front of category, now I'm getting it to count the category. So in order to understand that, I need way more time. But this is still the index function doing its thing, working creatively. OK, so uh, that's pretty much it for this partition topic. I'm not going to cover any more of it. I'm going to go ahead and now show you some more creative uses for the index function that you might 
use in your day-to-day -day usage of Tableau. I'm gonna open up a new sheet here. I'm just gonna open up a brand new sheet. We're gonna start afresh and make it simple because this thing I want to show you is actually quite a cool thing. Let me bring in subcategory and let me bring in sales again. We've seen this table already and let me just type in index, okay? And you'll see that um, we just use the index function in the ad hoc calculation here, set this to discrete and now we're good to go. Now. The thing about this is what if you want to count backwards, okay? Let's say that you actually wanted to assign the highest number to accessories and the lowest number to tables one, okay? Well, you can actually do that, but you have to be creative about how you do it. You have to think of another function that you can use that will actually do that. And that function is called the rank function. Now, it's kind of interesting because a rank function looks at the largest number and by default sorts in descending order. So if you wrap the index function, in the rank function, you essentially get a mechanism for counting backwards. So this is one of those weird ones where if you just put a function inside of a function, you get a totally different behavior that maybe you didn't expect. So let me just type in rank here. It will obviously delete my index as I do that and then hit index again. And I'm just gonna have to manually type that in. So you can see here, I've wrapped the index function inside of the rank function. I'm gonna hit enter. And now you see that accessory sh shoots to the top because it's now the largest item. So let me go and um, change this to a discrete item. And now you'll see it's counting backwards, okay? So this is a very creative use of using this. Let me show you an actual practical use case that I use all the time with dates. I'm gonna open up a new sheet. I'm gonna bring in order date. I'm gonna put it on rows. And while it's here, I just wanna do a couple of things. I wanna change the date type here to month. Then I'm gonna change this to discrete. We've got that behavior between, you know, discrete and continuous items behaving again. That's blue versus green essentially. So I'm gonna bring in the sales value into the ABC section here. And now you see this long list of items with the most recent data, December, 2020, being at the bottom. Man, 2020, we all want to forget 2020 for lots of good reasons. Um, but that is the most recent data set in this data set. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do this. I'm going to say index, okay? And you're going to see the count in action. So now it's counting from top to bottom and it's doing exactly as expected, except for what if I just want the most recent rows? Well, if I was to go to the bottom and just select number 48 to 46, as more rows get added, actually those numbers will increase. So that's not a reliable way of just keeping the most recent data. Yes, I could use a date filter, but when you're doing more complex filtering, it can actually get really, really tricky to define that as a filter. So what I often do as a sort of little cheat and a hack is I use the index function to fix this. So let me go ahead in here and wrap this in a rank. Let me just type rank, and then I'll just highlight the index function and I'll cut it and I'll put it inside of my rank function. And now you'll see what happens. If I go back and make this discrete again, you'll see that now my most recent data has the value one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I want the most recent six months, what I then end up doing is I just hold shift, select one to six, keep only, and now as the data updates, it's only ever gonna have the most recent six rows because it's counting from the bottom rather than from the top. And that's sort of a really simple but creative use case of using two functions together, rank and index, uh, to sort of make that work. Now that's done, what you can also do is you can right click on here and hide the header, essentially untick this option. And now you don't even have your counts in your view. So you can essentially use that to drive some behavior, but then immediately remove it from the view. I could also just move it here onto detail and it still works because it's in the context of my visualization. So you don't have to have it here in the row shelf for it to do its thing. So that's just some creative use cases of how this works. Um, I hope you enjoyed that, okay? So you can really have fun with the index function you can really do a lot of things. It looks like a very simple function, but then it becomes really, really powerful and has lots of use cases. And um, be sure to check out my video on the rank function. I actually did that just a few days ago. I'll put a link to it in the description above and also in the description below. So check that out. Um, I'm going to stop the video here. I could go on and on about other use cases for index, um, but I think that's enough for one video. Um, if you've got other use cases for the index function, drop them in the comments below. I'd love to know about them. Uh, let me know on Twitter. Um, otherwise, you know what to do. It's the end of the video. I'll catch you in the next one. If you've liked the video, you know what to do. If you don't, let me know in the comments what you'd like to see instead. And uh, yeah, see you in the next video.